breathing in the acrid smells of the port, I've begun to feel the pulse of the Amazon. This river fascinates me, and I want to follow its course upstream, taking the opposite direction to Francisco de Orellana, who traveled down it hundreds of years ago with a handful of badly shaven conquistadors. I've learned that Belem, a city of 1,700,000 inhabitants, was founded in the 17th century by the Portuguese, who were keen to exploit its potential as a major trade center. The rubber boom soon proved them right and became the basis for the city's prosperity. Despite the city's charms, I can't bring myself to stay here for long. And I can't wait to embark on this adventure. I want to get onto the river as soon as possible and start my exploration of the country's rich interior. A hastily recruited interpreter helps me make the arrangements for my long-awaited departure. There's no boat on Tuesday, so the next one is on Friday night. Is that okay? I have to wait two days, two long days to fill. I'd heard about Marajo, an island as big as Denmark, located at the heart of the river delta. That's how I ended up at Key 37 in the early hours of the morning, ready to board the San Francisco, the first local boat I would travel on. deck, I begin to realize the size, or rather the enormity of this river. And the fact that we are 100 kilometers from the Atlantic, where this giant serpent, the mother of man, as the Amerindians call it, ends its journey. tempted to take in the breeze at the bow of the boat, but quickly realize that an occasionally violent wind from the ocean greatly exaggerates the pitching of this frail craft. Of course, that is an inappropriate description of this boat, but the vastness of the river is such that it has warped my sense of scale. I've only skippered this boat for a few months, but don't worry. I've sailed up and down the river mouth for several years. We don't have too many problems on this service. At this time of year, the dry season, the concern is the wind from the sea which can cause problems. It can cause waves as large as those out to sea. This boat doesn't have a large draft, so when it's windy, it moves a lot. In the rainy season, there isn't much wind, but the heavy rains greatly affect visibility. It took us a little over three hours to reach the cork. I say cork because Marajo is short for Umbarayo which is the word for cork in the Marajoara language. The original inhabitants of the island believed it had been placed here by a divine being to prevent the river from emptying itself entirely into the ocean. The bus taking us the 37 kilometers from the pier to Sur has to board a ferry to cross an inland river and so reach the town and its population of 29,000. It's soon clear that Sur, considered the capital of the island, appears to be a small seaside town where life is good. A kind of tropical and perpetually peaceful Côte d'Azur. In the hustle and bustle, I get a glimpse of what Sunday will be like for the procession of Our Lady of Nazareth, patron saint of the city. 
The enthusiasm with which the preparations are made makes me wish I could be here. Instead, I'll be somewhere between Belém and Manaus. The most surprising thing on Marajo Island are the buffalo. It is said that the buffalo arrived here by accident in 1870, when a ship transporting them to Guyana sank. Today, they are everywhere. They can be found at even the smallest waterhole, wallowing like hippos. Along with fishing, they are the backbone of the local economy. There are around one million on the island, whilst the human population is only 385,000. The buffalo is the island symbol, and there seems to be nothing the beast can't be used for. In fact, Marajo is the only place in the world where the mounted police patrol on the back of a buffalo. I've served in this unit for three years. I'm also a vet, as I know a lot about animals, especially buffalo. We've used buffalo on patrols since 1992, because on the island we have six dry months, followed by six months of very intensive rainfall. During the rainy season, the island is completely flooded, so it's very difficult to get about. So the only really effective mode of transport is the water buffalo. They are better than any vehicle, even horses, because they can go anywhere. Here we call them four by fours on legs. I leave the police and their strange mounts. Someone told me about a posada, a sort of rural cottage owned by a Frenchman, and I have one day left to kill on the island. Thierry, the proprietor, has been living here for three years, so he should be able to give me some good advice. All right, yes, okay, thanks. Were you with some guests? I don't have any right now. No? It's the low season. That's a stroke of luck. You can take him into the rainforest. He needs a guide. Aren't you a bird expert? That's why, the following day, I board an old tub to an unknown destination, accompanied by a French-speaking ornithologist as my guide. My name is Aswaldo. I'm a tourist guide for the Belém region. I've been doing this for 17 years. We'll be going up the Paraquari River to the island's interior to visit a buffalo breeding farm. Buffaloes are the basis of the island's economy. More buffalo. Indeed, it's difficult to get away from them here. But during the journey, the scenery is superb particularly the shortcuts down the Inguarapes, the small natural or artificial canals which create a network of secondary waterways across the whole of the Amazon rainforest. It's incredible to think that in the late 18th century, a Portuguese landowner made his slaves open a canal to shorten his journey and avoid losing cargo when sailing on the river. They built this whole canal as a shortcut and to protect themselves from large waves. It took five long years to dig this 1,800-metre bypass channel with machetes and spades. At saint Show Farm, Anna, the manager, is a long way from this amazing story. Here, the focus is on the here and now, 
ensuring the profitability of this farm of several thousand hectares. This is the last stage of the traditional cheese-making process, one of many such traditions we continue to keep alive on the farm. On this fazenda, as on many others, everything revolves around the buffalo. We milk them to make mozzarella-type cheese, as you can see. But we do not just raise buffalo, we also have small horses, as well as some Nelo cows. Despite their rustic appearance and seemingly carefree approach to life, the fazendeiros are nevertheless practical people. Above all, they are businessmen and women, whose sole aim is for their farms to be prosperous. <laughs> However, their employees, the vaqueros, lead a very tough life, especially during the rainy season. They often have to cover many kilometers through flooded bogs in search of lost buffalo. Come on, I'll show you our little museum. How about that? It seems strange to find a small museum here, but on reflection, it makes sense as tourists always stay at the fazenda and want a closer look at the lives of their hosts. All of the pieces you see in this collection are the result of finds made on fazendas owned by my family. Certain pieces date back to the pre-Columbian period, but I don't have time to stay. It's a shame because Marajo Island is the cradle of one of the oldest indigenous Amazonian civilizations. Before leaving my hosts, I sample some of the food as promised. But hang on, where has Osvaldo, my guide, got to? I find him a bit later, away from the farm. He's indulging his passion, watching some scarlet ibis. He later tells me that Marajo is the only place in Brazil they can be found. I watch them fly away. It is time for me to leave the island. I have a boat to Manaus to catch tomorrow. I am writing again to tell you that I am finally cruising up the Amazon. We set sail late afternoon from Belém. The riverbanks seem far away now, disappearing into the mystery of the slowly falling equatorial night. All is slow. All is long. All would be silent, but for the incessant noise of the engines. It will take us five days and five nights to cover the 1,500 kilometers which separate the two biggest towns along the river. On board the Cisne Branco, which means white swan, there are around 100 passengers. Everyone timidly watches each other, taking in the surroundings. And there is no shortage of things to see. There's little rest to be had on the first night, as we regularly stop to let people on and off and load and unload various cargoes. Even the captain looks exhausted, and few people, passengers or crew, can get much sleep. We stop again in the early hours, and there are still things to be seen. Some freshwater dolphins come tantalizingly into view, and between two passing boats, we even get to glimpse a rare pink specimen. After unloading some cargo, we set off again, and I'm beginning to understand that the people of the Amazon basin travel more on water than on land. This forest doesn't like roads. 
It prefers its natural paths, the Inguarapes, the streams and rivers. It's difficult not to share that view, since in this vast network of waterways, the 17 main tributaries which feed into the Amazon include some of the 10 biggest rivers in the world. On the passenger deck, everyone has secured themselves some space. It's limited, certainly, but enough for the five days and four nights ahead. The hammocks lend themselves to laziness, which is only natural. These simple bits of cloth are the only place we can call our own and try to find some privacy while the journey lasts. While some of us can laze around, the same cannot be said of the staff. In the kitchen, work starts at dawn. The 15 or so members of the crew must have their two meals a day, as well as the passengers. It's occasionally tiresome work, as the kitchen is next to the engine room, and the incessant, deafening noise is enough to put anyone off. On the bridge deck above, things are calmer. So calm that the captain can read his paper there in peace. Sailors, even freshwater ones, clearly need a few moments to themselves. This boat doesn't have a relief crew and makes four or five return journeys a month. It's a peculiar lifestyle, spending all your time on the river. The job invariably means neglecting your family and sometimes the only way to see your children is to extend your stopovers in the ports where they live. I'm the captain of this boat, and I've skippered it for 24 years. As you can see, our job here on the Amazon is to transport cargo and passengers. I'm originally from Santarém, the large port halfway between Belém and Manaus. My whole family also lives there. With regard to sailing, we don't have many problems. A few storms sometimes, and some of them can be quite violent. The passengers panic, so we have to stop and drop anchor in a cove. But generally speaking, it's quite rare. We don't have many problems. I would even say that it's a pleasure to sail on this river. Today, the weather is very mild, so people get together to pass the time, a situation which lends itself nicely to a game of dominoes. Throughout the Amazon region, dominoes are made of wood, an abundant natural resource. On the river, it is not unusual to see barges loaded with logs. In the Amazon, nothing can stop nature, except perhaps the chainsaws of the foresters. Some might think that it's boring on this boat, but I can assure you that there is little respite and there's always something going on. Take these young Amazon boatmen. They hook themselves onto the boat at full speed like pirates. These daredevils are sometimes barely five years old. Their aim is to glean a few coins by selling a variety of goods to the passengers, often astounded by their incredible daring. Disembarking at Santarem at around 4 a.m. is truly enchanting. This is how travel should always be. 
the ancient Greeks had a god for this perfect moment. He was called Kairos and stipulated that arriving in port had to be done at dawn, no matter where in the world. As for myself, I want to enjoy a few moments on dry land. And as the boat was stopping over here for about half a day, I made the most of it to watch the activity of the market, which was leisurely filling its stalls. The early morning catches up with me. To stay awake, I need lots of coffee. That's how I meet Tita, the owner of the only refreshment stand here. I've been doing this job, running the refreshment stand, for three years. Before that, I used to work for the Port Authority. It is very tough because this is a daily market. I'm here every day from 3 a.m. to 8 p.m. I have little time to myself because when I get home, I go to bed and try to sleep a bit. My children are grown up and my husband, a fisherman, fends for himself. I leave Tita to her grueling work. I still have a bit of time in Santarem before the Cisne Branco leaves. I've been told about an idyllic place about 35 kilometers from the town. Without much haggling over the price, I hire the first taxi driver I come across. To take you to Alta do Cheo, I'll charge you 55 euros. The journey gives me another insight into the Amazon. We're barely out of town before I see quite how dense the rainforest is. At the end of the road is a magical place, Altair do Chao. It's almost like a different planet, and I wonder if this could be the perfect place to leave the rest of the world behind. Jean-Jacques Rousseau would surely have thought this an ideal place in which to hide and escape from human stupidity. He would have loved this point of no return, this island for castaways, happy to be just that. I am fascinated by the place. I look around in silence and watch the curious behavior of the locals. I barely have time to board before we set sail. Everyone gets their bearings again, less timidly than the first time. These kinds of trips make it easy to form new friendships. It's certainly true for Marlene and Sergio. They are both married with children. He is off to be a DJ on the Venezuelan border. She is heading to Manaus to see her family. As soon as the river starts to narrow, they're back hitching a ride. Sergio isn't interested. He's enthusiastically telling Marlene about the new life he hopes to have. It's actually quite a wrench because he will be away from his wife and his four-year-old daughter for several months. Suddenly, I experience my first storm. It arrives without warning, but I do have the good fortune to be under shelter which, looking out on the river, is not something everyone can say. It is still raining when I see the confluence of the Rio Solimoes and the Rio Negro. It is the first thing that makes me realize that this boat trip is almost over. The second is the activity of the passengers who hastily begin gathering up their belongings. I am not in a hurry. I don't want to miss any of the varied surprises which could still come my way, like these Navy warships moored about 1,500 kilometers from any sea or ocean. Just a few meters to go before the moorings are cast ashore. After that is done, everything happens quickly. The passengers disembark with incredible speed, as though they were escaping. 
I barely have time to glimpse Marlene and Sergio saying goodbye. All that remains for me to do is to find a hotel. A little later, from the headland, I can see the city stretching out along the left bank of the Rio Negro. Manaus seems to be buoyed by the nostalgic memories of its glorious past, when it was called the Paris of the tropics, the golden city of the rubber billionaires. Today, with its 1.5 million inhabitants, the city attempts in vain to recreate the splendor of its golden years. Staying here doesn't really interest me. I have seen the people who live on the riverbanks from my boat. I now want to see the boats from where these people live. I am sailing on the Amazon, which from this point is known as the Solimoyes. With two engines and 960 horsepower, we are traveling at more than 50 kilometers per hour. The craft that I boarded in the early hours, along with a few other people, is known as a fast boat a true speedboat, Amazon style. Nothing to do except watch the riverbank speed by, or why not the television, which is belching out Bruce Lee's DVD collection. It will take us 12 hours to reach Tefe, where I'm thinking of staying a while. After that, I'll head for Fonte Boa and God willing, Tabatinga. Coming ashore at Tefe, a strange feeling comes over me, one of intense oppression, as though the further I travel on the river, the more I reject all modern life and all large towns. It's not that this one, with its 50,000 inhabitants, is excessively large, but I'm already finding it too big for me. I've made a decision. Tomorrow, I will go out on the rivers in search of something more authentic. I find this authenticity close by, among the people who live on the banks of the river, known here as Caboclos and who are of mixed European and Brazilian Amerindian descent. This village of around 250 souls, which overlooks one of the branches of the Solimoyes, is called Missao, mission in English. And when you arrive here, you can easily understand why. At first sight, everything is calm, as though life had little or no relevance here. Hello, my French friend. I'm pleased to welcome you here. I'm the village chief. Come on, let's go for a walk, and I'll show you around. I learned that my host, who answers to the name Monato, was first elected village chief in 1989. Elections are by universal suffrage, and by law, no one can have more than two successive mandates of two years. So our friend has been village chief since 1989, with a break of two years every four years. We have a small village, but we produce some handicrafts. 52 families live here, which, as of today, represents 256 people. We make our living mainly from agriculture, cassava, cocoa, bananas, acai palm, chestnuts, and so on. Many also make use of the river, for example, by fishing, but it is largely for their own consumption. In this village, there are only farmers. It is a pleasant village, but it is short of everything. It has little or no electricity. A single generator provides some electricity between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. However, the people do adhere to Brazilian traditions, especially football. There are six league matches today. It is the women who get stuck in first because they are daughters, sisters or mothers and while football is important here, so too is preparing meals. There is no healthcare system in the village either. All it has is a small clinic which provides basic medication. It's the same in many villages in the Amazon. 
and so the state has provided this magnificent boat. It belongs to the army and carries doctors, dentists and other social workers on board. It sails along the river from village to village to alleviate the shortages. The women's match has finished. They won one nil. It is time to go to the kitchen while the men get ready to take on the nearby Amerindian community. The home leg went in favor of Misao with an emphatic 8-0 scoreline. The away fixture will be fierce. It's a special day today. We're playing football against the Amerindian community from Barira. This match counts towards the official provincial league. We have a slight edge for the next game, but it's far from over. This time, the final score is 3-0 to the Amerindians. But it is not enough, and Misao qualify easily in the thunderstorm. The following day, I'm off to the airport to catch an air taxi to Fonteboa, a town about 180 kilometers upstream. I'm a pilot with a company called Amazon Aves Air Taxis. I spent three years at flying school in Curitiba, whilst at the same time studying aeronautical science at university. I finished my studies five years ago and have been doing this job since then. Air taxis are quite common in the Amazon. I mainly carry passengers, some urgent letters and sometimes cargo. The aircraft I fly are Pipers and AT320Cs. The flight to Fonteboa should take around 50 minutes. The storm is close and we take off in the rain. Victor has told me that the main problem here is the weather, which you can only forecast up to one hour ahead. still pouring when we land. To pilot an air taxi in the Amazon, you have to adapt quickly to the unexpected. At barely 30, Victor has been doing just that for five years now, over an area eight times the size of France. It's still home to Amerindian tribes who are occasionally resistant to all contact with civilization. I'm beginning to notice that at this time of year, the rain often doesn't last long. As I get off the plane, I decide not to enter Fonteboa. The further I travel up this river, the more I want to distance myself from these ever-growing towns, which are threatening already fragile ecosystems. I also want to meet some locals, people who work hard every day just to survive. And so I find myself in a village of barely 30 souls on the banks of the river 
far from the hazards of the big cities. I introduce myself to Francisco, a fisherman who lives with his entire family in a hut on the water. It is the same type of home that I had the luxury of gazing at during my time on the boat from Belém to Manaus. I often wondered, when gazing at them, what they looked like inside. Francisco satisfies my curiosity by inviting me into the privacy of his home. I am not disappointed, quite the opposite. The simplicity of the place is touching. These few wooden rooms, where life is stripped down to the essentials, okay. are thoroughly captivating. My name is Francisco. I've been a fisherman for six years. It's quite unpredictable here. Sometimes I manage to catch enough fish. Other times I barely catch enough to cover the day's costs. There aren't as many fish as before. Stocks have dried up. It's a hard life. If Francisco catches a six kilo fish, he can sell it at the market for around six euros. But that is rare nowadays, and his daily costs, including petrol, amount to two euros. It is not always easy to make ends meet, so he also cultivates a small patch of land, which he was clearing when we arrived. His improvised farm means he can feed his wife and three children. As I leave Francisco, I feel like making a detour, so I asked the pilot of the boat I hastily rented this morning to sail down a small branch of the river, one of those famous Inguarapes. I hope to catch a glimpse of the amazing wealth of fauna that people have told me so much about. I'd love to spot an anaconda or any of the other reptiles that live in the water or on the banks of the river. It is a magnificent place, which reminds me of something I once heard said by a well-known presenter of wildlife programs on TV. When nature is as generous as this, only one thing comes to mind. Silence. This caiman fleeing into the muddy water brings me back to my senses. It's time to leave, because tomorrow I'm going to visit the Amerindians. And so it was that in the early hours of the morning, I found myself on the river Javari, traveling the 400 kilometers to Tres Jose, a Mayaruna village. I'm accompanied by Evan Dike, an adventurous boat captain, his assistant, an Amerindian tribe tracker, and above all, Mowgli a guide of Amerindian descent. Helped along by a 260 horsepower engine, we speed along at over 50 kilometers per hour. I'm told the journey will take eight hours. The river Javari marks the border between Brazil on the left bank and Peru on the right. The funniest thing is that during the whole journey, we regularly cross from bank to bank, from one country to the other. I'm called Mowgli, but my real name is Tony. I've worked on the Javari for 10 years. I'm a guide, because I know the Amerindian communities here. I know their cultures and traditions. So I regularly accompany tourists to the various villages. I am respected for my knowledge of their customs and practices. 
I'm of Amerindian origin, from the Marinahas tribe, from a region on the border of Brazil and Colombia. Both my parents are from this tribe, but at the time of the last rubber boom, they were forced to flee to avoid being killed, as others had been. That's why I was born in Tabatinga, the last large Brazilian town on the border with Colombia. Because of the loops in the river, we frequently save a few minutes on our journey time by taking shortcuts down certain natural canals. They are rarely used at this time of year though, because the water levels are still low and you can get a nasty surprise. I soon learned that unfortunate but enlightening lesson. First, a tree blocks our path. It takes over an hour to chop. My guide ventures into the water to check for any further obstacles. We finally set off again but not very far. Another fallen tree, this time even bigger, blocks our path. We set to work, but without much conviction. <laughs> Impatient, I ask if this is a frequent occurrence. The answer is yes. With my occasionally condescending Western attitude, I say, don't you think a chainsaw would be useful? The slightly infuriated captain replies immediately, we barely have enough to eat, so how do you propose we buy a chainsaw? And so I learn another lesson. We've no choice but to turn around, and although we've lost a lot of time, I won't say another word. We get back to the Javari, but we still must search for the village. I'm told it has been moved because of land reforms. Ah, oh. hey. We eventually find it, and not before time, as I was worried we'd turn up at the tribe's settlement after nightfall. Not out of fear, but because I want to see as much as possible of these people and their lives. My first surprise is the way they dress. It's nothing like the Amazon I saw in my vision in the forest. I can't spend much time with the Mayaruna Indians, but I hope to gain at least an insight into their culture. The gods are on my side, because in one of the village huts, the local shaman is about to start work. Mowgli explains enthusiastically that the shaman is doing the job of a kinesiologist on one of the men from the tribe who has back pain. It's one of the shaman's regular roles, in addition to that of doctor. <laughs> I imagine the pain is supposed to disappear thanks to the massage and the incantations. But on closer inspection, I realize that's not all. The shaman uses local herbs to blow on the patient's back and then inhales the pain, which he then spits out elsewhere. 
I don't know if the man will be healed, but the treatment continues for some time. Mowgli tells me that a more traditional and more important ritual is due to take place later this evening. The shaman has been asked to help one of the villagers who has lost his power to hunt and fish. In fact, he hasn't caught anything for several days. For this type of ritual, you need a patient, a shaman, a warrior from the tribe who is a great hunter and fisherman, and a toad that you've caught the night before. The warrior is believed to pass his powers on to the unfortunate who has lost them. First, he must inhale ayahuasca, a hallucinogenic powder highly prized by the Amerindians. This mysterious and powerfully psychoactive drug is the subject of great debate, much like peyote and LSD were in the days of Carlos Castaneda and Timothy Leary. The shaman burns small dots on the patient's skin so that it will easily absorb a white liquid extracted from a toad. It's with some alarm that I discovered that the liquid is in fact curare, used not so long ago to coat blowpipe darts and used to chase off or even kill intruders. It's quite a mystery, because the Amerindians were decimated by flu, but have always been immune to cure. For several hours after the ritual comes to an end, I remain in a sort of daze, full of wonder and lost in thought. I even find it hard getting to sleep in the hammock I'm given for the night. The only thing on my mind is to find out if the ayahuasca, the cure, and the incantations have done their job. Very early in the morning, I find myself watching the fisherman who'd been the center of the ritual the day before. And yes, it works. After a few fruitless attempts, and despite my incredulity, he succeeds in harpooning a fish. It's time for me to leave, to return to civilization, or rather, to my civilization. I find it 400 kilometers upstream in the last Brazilian town on the river, Tabatinga. I'm at the end of my journey and I won't be going any further. On the other side of the border, in Colombia, the lights of Letitia are shining brightly. I stop by the river for a moment and think back over my journey. 3,500 kilometers packed full of emotion and adventure. But my quest is over. Thank mm -hmm. you.